Hello, students. This is Professor Gore, and this is uh, we're going to do, I'm going to cover this lecture, kind of a three part um, recorded lecture series and so forth. And so this one is talking about the Democratic Revolution. So basically what happens politically uh, between James Madison uh, and, and, and James Monroe, kind of the era of good feelings all the way through the Jacksonian era, uh, through Martin Van Buren into the election of William e. Harrison and then eventually his death and John Tyler taking over. So a uh, lot changes. Uh, a lot more Americans get the right to vote, particularly as states uh, remove the property qualifications to vote. And so uh, tenant farmers could vote, uh, wage earners could vote and so forth. And really, you see uh, the rise of Andrew Jackson as kind of this personification of the self-made American uh, man and so forth rising to power. And, and during his time in office, um, he was both beloved and hated. And the people that loved him, he ended up becoming one of the most popular presidents while he was in office in American history. Uh, but those that hated him um, absolutely despised him. And I would say that today he's one of those presidencies, presidents you either love him or you hate him uh, in American history. So um, one thing that, uh, you know, as, as visitors came to the United States and they began to witness what was going on is, um, you know, they were really impressed with what the United States had founded with its Republic. Um, you know, one of the things that you'll see is a guy named, uh, Alec de Tocqueville. Um, he traveled to the United States, um, it, during the Jacksonian presidency and, and really was a, was a sociologist and kind of made his observations known about um, what he had kind of witnessed in American history. And it's kind of fascinating um, how he noticed that Americans had individualism, um, yet at the same time, they had a strong sense of community. Um, he also saw that uh, um, they, they had these different constitutional principles and so forth. And so um, he was impressed with that. Um, he also saw where free blacks and African-Americans would struggle. He, he said that it would be difficult for them to assimilate. He also um, you know, said, predicted they would be rejected, which uh, you see that take place uh, late in the times with Jim Crow South. Um, you also see um, de Tocqueville making the observation that Native Americans kind of needed to assimilate. Uh, otherwise, they would struggle to survive and said that they would be difficult for them to assimilate. And he's coming during the, the time period when the Interremoval Act is about to be passed. Uh, and so um, he was impressed with American republicanism and uh, not necessarily like tied to political party republicanism, but just idea of democracy. And so his book is called Democracy uh, in America. And it's his observations of, of kind of what he uh, observed in American history. So, you know, in the first uh, few decades of American history, you saw the intellectual elite elected to office. Um, but as time goes along, you start seeing just popular party politicians are elected in the 1820s and 1830s, not, not just at the national level, uh, particularly at the state and local level. Okay. Uh, one of the things too, is that, uh, um, you know, as these visitors come to the United States and they're impressed with the U.S. Republic, they did see the ordinary citizens ignored important issues of policy and refused to elect their intellectual superiors to office, which was Europeans were, were, were dumbfounded by that. In the early years of the U.S., some of the best and brightest ran the government as they thought it was their civic duty. But by the 1820s, 1930s, you, as I mentioned, you have these popularly, uh, elected politicians. And some of these, there's there's cases in, in American history where at local elections, those who, who bought the most alcohol uh, on election day end up winning. Um, and so sometimes these new party politicians often pursued selfish goals, uh, but by uniting ordinary Americans in election fever and party organizations, they held together a social order increasingly fragmented by economic change and cultural diversity. All right, so I just want to throw this in here because it's very important that we covered at the end of the Era of Good Feelings um, um, lecture is the Missouri Compromise of 1820. So um, basically, if you remember, the uh, Maine becomes a free state, Missouri would be a slave state, and any state that it comes in the union below Missouri, okay, the 3630 line, so Arkansas, Louisiana, Texas, Oklahoma would be slave. And any state north of that line in the Louisiana Purchase would be free. Okay, so like Kansas, Nebraska, the Dakotas, um, uh, Montana, Wyoming, parts of that was in the Missouri Compromise. I mean, uh, uh, Louisiana Purchase. Okay, let's talk about the rise of, of popular politics. So 
Expansion of the right to vote known as franchise. Anytime you see where somebody is franchised um, and term re referring to politics, referring to the right to vote. If somebody's disenfranchised, it means they are prevented from voting. So later in, in American history, uh, African-Americans were disenfranchised with the Jim Crow South. Uh, and then even Native Americans were disenfranchised until 1924 uh, from voting. And so now, not, not to be confused with like a restaurant franchise like McDonald's or something, but uh, anyway, but that's what the, the term means in this context. Um, and so with more people getting the right to vote, this is what historians mean by a democratic revolution. As early as 1810, some states had extended the right to vote to almost all white men, bringing many farmers and wage earners into a political arena by ending traditional property qualifications for voting. So like I said, tenant farmers could vote. Uh, nowhere else in the world did ordinary men have so much power. So even though women are denied the right to vote, African-Americans are denied the right to vote, uh, Native Americans are denied the right to vote, which crazy is across the world, more Americans had the right to vote than anywhere else uh, in the world at that time. OK, um, so that you got to put it in the historical context of the day. Um, and by 1832, only 10 percent of British subjects were allowed to vote, to give you an example. So one of the things that that uh, that was used to get people to vote um, is that, like, let's say you were a banker um, and you were running for office. You'd say, all right, well, if you vote for me, I'll lend money to you to buy farm equipment. Um, giving business to storekeepers. Like if you're a merchant, well, I'll buy some of your stores uh, products if you vote for me. Um, they bought them alcohol at election day. Um, and so you see these types of things that happen. Now, the American Revolution kind of weakened the differential society of the colonial era, but it did not overthrow it. Only two state constitutions, those of Pennsylvania and Vermont, allowed male taxpayers to vote. And even those states, families in the low and middle ranks continued to accept the leadership of the social betters. That's just what you did culturally at that time. Northern landlords, slave owning planters and seaport merchants were in charge of the political system in the first decade of the Republic and did quite well. As time went on, though, some lent money to small farmers, gave business to storekeepers and treated their tenants to alcohol at election time just to entice them to participate. I'm not kidding. There were actually some local elections where those who bought the most alcohol got got elected. Now, um, one of the things, though, that you see is uh, Maryland was one of the first states where reformers sought to expand their vote to include all men who did not own property. Now, I know this is a picture of Martin Van Buren uh, with some crazy cyber, and I'm going to cover him in just a second. Um, but one of the things, though, that you, you did see is when they achieved what they sought, poor men elected men who dressed simply and endorsed democracy. So when, when the poor men, adult men, get the right to vote, they tended, particularly in rural states, or areas like in the frontier or is expanding in the Western states, they voted men into office who they related to, okay, that maybe uh, will have more money than them, but kind of was a self-made man and so forth, uh, kind of this rugged frontiersman like Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson personified who was popular um, when, as, as more and more of these poor farmers began to vote and so forth. And it also kind of led to the decline of this elite dress of the upper class. And so we're now granted they did wear nicer suits and so forth, but because of the industrial revolution, um, every, you know, not every man, but a lot of men could afford to buy a suit. Now um, it would have nicer fabric if they were in the upper class and so forth, but at least you dressed in a suit. Um, once in public office, men from modest backgrounds enacted laws that restricted imprisonment for debt. So protecting those that had gone to prison for debt or uh, for, for, for basic prevention, be able to pay back their debt. They kept taxes low, so that was very popular. Um, you know, nobody wakes up and say, hey, I, I can't wait to pay my taxes. Now, some people may favor more taxes. That's for the things that it can provide. Um, but, but this day and age in American society, the vast majority of Americans favor lower taxes. It allowed farmers to, to claim squatters' rights to unoccupied land, so basically you could live on it, even if you didn't own it. And by the mid-1820s, only a few states, North Carolina, Virginia, and Rhode Island, required the ownership of freehold property for voting. Many states had instituted universal white male suffrage. Now, granted, you had to be 21. You had to be an adult. And others, Ohio and Louisiana, for example, excluded only the relatively few men who did not pay taxes or serve in the militia. Um, so basically, states are giving the right to vote to more and more adult men. Okay. Now, corruption was present in these state and local governments throughout Unfortunately, as politicians accepted bribes, gave breaks to certain businesses and bought uh, shares of stock before it could be sold to the public. 
Only Americans turned to politics to advance their, their religious and cultural agenda advocated by the benevolent reformers. And that is the Second Great Awakening and the reform movements that come out of that. Now, this guy, Martin Van Buren, um, is, is an interesting guy. He really was a self-made man in American history, uh, was a political genius in how he operated party politics. Um, and he is going to become a president in American history. Now, he's a one-term president, and that's because of the Panic of 1837. He kind of rode in uh, the White House on the coattails of Andrew Jackson. But Andrew Jackson probably would not have been as popular politically if it wasn't for Martin Van Buren's strategy of, of, of managing his campaign and so forth. Um, now, Van Buren also, unfortunately, starts the first political machine. It's called the Albany Regency and used the Albany Argus newspaper to promote political platform and get out the vote. And what a party machine was is that basically you could not really run for office for the Democrats in New York unless you were part of this political machine. And, and, and political machines are going to involve uh, where later they're going to exploit Irish uh, immigrants and so forth, as we talked about in the part three of the economic uh, transformation recorded lecture and so forth. And so uh, uh, political machines are going to get worse, and especially in the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s. Tammany Hall was the most notorious and so forth. Um, now, in New York alone, uh, this political machine appointed 6,000 supporters to judges, justices of the peace, sheriffs, deed commissioners, and, and, and coroners. And so they became known, this became known as a spool system. So like, hey, if you give us your support, then we might give you a government position. Um, later in the 1870s, civil service reform is going to be passed where you can't get a government position without having the qualifications and take a, a competency test that you can actually do the job that you're being appointed. Uh, Van Buren argued that it was uh, far since both political parties could do it and that it was thoroughly Republican because it was based on the rule of the majority. Van Buren insisted that all party members follow the dictates of the party caucus overall belief and views of the party. So uh, this is where you start seeing in American history that you're supposed to kind of be pe uh, pegged into one political party or another. Okay. Now we've already kind of covered the population density. So people are moving west okay, by 1830. And uh, you start seeing new states that are forming. And then you look at voter turnout. Really, voter turnout in American history is the highest once more, um, you know, non-property owning men get the right to vote. And, and the highest voter turnout is actually in the 1880s, uh, one of the highest of, of times of political corruption. Now, um, today, you know, in the 2000s, we have one of the lowest voter turnouts of any westernized nation. And that's that's uh, shameful. So. As I always tell my students, every year I've ever been a teacher, look, um, I don't necessarily care how you vote, but I expect you to do three things as, an, uh, as a citizen. I expect you to register to vote because you can't vote without registering. I expect you to be informed and I expect you to vote. And so uh, we need uh, Americans being informed and participating in the political process. OK. Now, election of 1824 was a tough um, election. And really because the, the Democrat Republican Party um, just is the only party in existence. The Federalists are done by 1820. And so you have five people who run for office. Uh, these four individuals, and I don't have a picture of William Crawford. So Henry Clay of Kentucky this is the first time he runs for president. And it's going to be one of three. John Quincy Adams, the son of President John Adams, one of the, probably the most brilliant and qualified man to be president. Um, also one of our um most successful secretaries of state, John Calhoun, senator um, from South Carolina, kind of the stereotypical wealthy planter elite, William Crawford uh, as well. And then the other guy is the man, the myth, the legend, Old Hickory, Andrew Jackson. And so my high school students, I always have them read a chapter from this book by Kenneth Davis called um, A Nation Rising. And it's a fascinating read and it really gives you good background quickly about uh, Andrew Jackson and I, whether you love him or hate him I think he's one of the most fascinating Americans in American history because um, he was a rags to riches story um, he was a self-made man and the man the, the guy had a hard life um, and, and, it, and he's, he's a complex individual yet he's simple in the sense that you know he, he hated Native Americans yet he found a Native American infant on a battlefield and raised him as his own son and loved him dearly until he died of tuberculosis at the age of 28. Um, and, you know, here he was, he had shot and killed six people in duels in the areas he, he did this in that were actually technically legal, which, uh, which is crazy to think about, um, and, uh, and fought it even more than that. Um, 
a lot of the times was defending his honor and defending the, the name of his wife. Um, and, and Rachel Jackson, his wife, he loved her dearly. Um, and, you know, he had a lot of his faults, but not loving his wife was not one of them. Um, and yet, um, you know, here he was, he, he was supposedly very mannerly at social events, yet he was kind of a rough around the edges guy. Um, and he also loved children. He would get on the ground on the floor and play with kids on his hands and knees, which was uh, somebody of his, uh, particularly when he was an upper class, wouldn't have done that in that day and age. Um, and yet, I mean, at times you're like, what in the world was this guy thinking? And so he is a complex individual uh, in American history and one that is, is you have to look at all of Jackson to fully understand um, who he was. Now, uh, the advance of political democracy and party government in the states undermined the old consensus of national politics and the power of notables who ran it. Um, and so with this election of 1824, you have five people that are supposedly all Democrat Republicans. Uh, and so um, Adams had kind of enjoyed the national recognition of being Secretary of State um, and helped carry New England. Henry Clay had framed his candidacy around domestic issues. Um, and Clay had, had, had uh, authored the American system and so forth. But Jackson was such a popular war hero from the Battle of New Orleans and also his invasion of, of Florida that eventually led to its purses, purchase, thanks to John Quincy Adams. And so really what happens is the final vote tally um, is you have uh, Andrew Jackson, who technically had more electoral votes and more popular votes, but he didn't have majority of electoral votes in order to win. So when that happens, it goes to the House of Representatives. Now, this never would have been an issue if Henry Clay and William Crawford had, um, along with John Calhoun, not ran for president. But since they did, it, um, Jackson only had 99 and he needed 131 to win of electoral votes. And so it goes to the House of Representatives. Now, um, in this particular election, there is rumored to be what was called a corrupt bargain. Now, um, What's interesting is that we don't have 100% uh, evidence that this, da this this agreement actually took place, but we can assume from what transpires that actually was happened. Now, we, we have evidence from John Quincy Adams' diary that Henry Clay came over and met with him one night uh, in, the, in the middle of the House of Representatives trying to, to um, figure this out. And um, we don't know what was discussed, but we can assume. And all we know is, is that Henry Clay supports John Adams becoming the next president over Andrew Jackson. Henry Clay and, and Andrew Jackson were arch political enemies. Um, and basically, Adams went, gets the House of Representatives majority vote and becomes president, and then Henry Clay becomes Secretary of State. And so it's assumed behind closed doors that Clay said, hey, I'll support you for president if you appoint me Secretary of State, because at that time, the Secretary of State was kind of the stepping stone of the presidency. And it, it backfires. And, and Jackson said a corrupt bargain has, has gone on behind closed doors and he vows to beat Adams in 1828, which he does. Okay, So this is a quote from his diary and so forth. And this is what you think that actually transpired. Now, John Quincy Adams, on paper, his resume was one of the most impressive resumes of any American president. Being a foreign diplomat as a young man, um, and, and Secretary of State, all these different congressional positions. I mean, he was brilliant mind. But just because you you look good on paper doesn't mean that you're actually going to have a successful presidency. Uh, unfortunately for him, he was his father's son in terms of people skills. He kind of came off cold and tactless. He intended to insult people at times um, because he thought he was smarter than him. He was arrogant, um, yet insecure behind closed doors, um, similar like his father. And um like his father, he also kept many of the same cabinet members that were serving under his predecessor, James Monroe. Uh, John Adams had done that, and it backfired because oftentimes these cabinet members didn't see eye to eye to him and uh, did not um, kind of really support uh, a lot of his policies. And so um, one of the things that um, he, he pushed for was um, he wanted to found a national university in Washington. It gets voted down. He wanted extensive scientific explorations in the far west, which which was important, but also voted down. And he wanted a uniform standards uh, of weights and measures. All three of those things would have been good um, if you had a better politician to accomplish those. Most important, um, he endorsed Henry Clay's American system of national economic development and its three key elements of tariffs, national bank, okay, and then also uh, infrastructure improvements. 
Okay, and he also wanted a uniform currency. So not as successful of a president as he should have been. And um, basically what ends up happening is in 1828, the Democratic Republican Party splits into the Democrat Republicans, which later just became the Democratic Party, uh, and the National Republicans, which later formed the Whigs. And then the Whigs are eventually going to disintegrate in the 1850s. And so um, now it's interesting, and I think it's just kind of funny. Um, Jackson, um, the reason why the Democrats uh, – animal that kind of represents them is the donkey is because when Jackson wins, uh, they had kind of, uh, his opponents called him a jackass. And so when he won in 1828, it was like, well, look, this jackass just beat you. So um, anyway, that's why the donkey represents the uh, the democratic party, which I found it kind of amusing. Um, and, and that's actually the term they use, not just donkey, but they actually call them uh, the term jackass. So um, now what happens is the election of 1828 is a nasty, nasty election. So I want to show you this slide right here um, because because of Jackson, both popularity and hatred, um, you have the modern, well, not modern, but the Democratic Party emerge in the election of 1828 and the National Republicans by 1832 become the Whigs. And so here's the things that they favored. The National Republicans, similar to the Federalists, favored strong national government where the Democrats favored states' rights, kind of like sounds like Jefferson way back when. Um, they favored the bank, sounds like the Federalist. Tariffs, sounds like the Federalist. Internal improvements, that's new. The Federalists probably would have supported that um, had they would have been around that time. Also, industry, sounds like the Federalists. Public schools and moral reforms. Um, and so one thing that's new that the Federalists weren't involved in, and that's the reform movements that come out of the Second Great Awakening. Um, and they felt like that the, the best and brightest should run the government. The Democrats were like, hey, we should be the common man. We're all about individual freedom, states' rights. We don't want, um, if you want infrastructure, that should be done at the state level. Okay. Now, um, so the American system does face resistance, um, although J Jackson actually favors voting for a tariff um, while he was in, the, uh, in Congress because um, um, he thought it would gain him political support in the election of 1828, and it does. Uh, remember that tariff because that's going to be um, ang it's going to anger the South, particularly John Quincy Adams. I mean, sorry, not John Quincy Adams, but John Calhoun, different John, um, senator from South Carolina. So they do pass one internal uh, uh, federal program, and that's the National Road. Okay. Now, the tariff of 1824 was supposed to protect American manufacturers in New England and Pennsylvania and other um, uh, manufacturing states. Um, Van Buren and Jackson pushed for that um, because they wanted to win supporters from states like New York, Ohio, and Kentucky. Now, the tariff of 1828, though, raised it even more because it really affected the South because it was a tariff on raw materials, textiles, and iron goods, goods that the Southerners imported, and it rose their, their price that they paid for that thing. So remember that when we get to the tariff of abomination battles. Um, so the South hated it because it cost them about $100 million a year. Okay. Now, it's, it's ironic that Jackson supported it, and yet he's kind of seen as a guy who didn't favor it when he actually did. That's how kind of ignorant some of the voters were at that time. And they blamed Adams when both of them were in favor of it. And um, also, one of the things that, that John Quincy Adams has prayed for today and Jackson is criticized for today is that Adams tried to protect Native Americans' land rights. Um, and, and one reason why he's criticized is because farmers in the Midwest and farmers in the South wanted their land. For cultivation, plain and simple, selfishness. They wanted their land to cultivate it. Okay, um, and so one of the things, uh, despite Adams' efforts, Georgia ends up forcing a lot of the Creeks to leave their state and they go to Alabama, and later they're forced to go to Oklahoma. So the uh, key issue in 1828 was Jackson saying there's corruption with a corrupt bargain. Um, there was also national debt. Now, one thing you got to praise Andrew Jackson for is he does bring. He's the first American president to bring the country from the red economically to the black economically. So we go from debt to finally having a, a balanced budget um, or not necessarily a balanced budget, but we just get out of debt that we owe to other countries. And so Jackson claims he's representing the people um, and argues that, that John um, Quincy Adams is representing special interests um, and, and so forth. Now um, what's interesting, this is probably one of the nastiest elections for uh, insults in American history, they call it the mudslinging campaign. And so they would just say all kind of accusations against, uh, uh, you know, both parties against each other. Um, for instance, they said that John Quincy Adams had, uh, was like a pimp and had given an American uh, virgin to the uh, czar of Russia. Okay, that's complete bogus. 
Um, they also said that Andrew Jackson's mom was a prostitute. Now, granted, um, that's that's there's not really evidence for that. Now, she may have been um, a loose woman or something, but she was not a prostitute. Um, they anyway, they said a bunch of horrible things against each other. Now, one of the things though they they go after his uh, and Jackson's political opponents is they said that uh, uh, Andrew Jackson, his wife Rachel, were adulterers. Now, that was not true. What happened was Rachel um, had, I think, lived in either Ohio or Kentucky, and her first husband had abused her. He was an alcoholic and was a beater and so forth, so she fled. Well, she ended up in, in, in Tennessee and Nashville, which is where Andrew Jackson met her. Now, back then, a, wa a woman was not allowed to file for divorce, regardless of the issue. I mean, obviously, the guy was horrible to her. And so she assumed, because he kind of abandoned her, that uh, that uh, he had filed for divorce. Well, her and Andrew Jackson met, fell in love, and, and Andrew Jackson loved her dearly and took care of her. Um, well, because that she had not actually been divorced, their marriage was seen as a scandal and, um, you know, uh, kind of a moral sham and so forth. So they really attacked his wife. And uh, in between him getting elected um, in November, uh, of 1828, him get inaugurated in March of 1829, she died. And really, Jackson kind of became a bitter old man and, and said, I will forgive people for what they said to me, but I will never forgive what they said against my wife, Rachel. And so um, you kind of can see his just being a stubborn old man and so forth as a result of, of, of his wife's death. And so here is, um, they were finally divorced, um, but it was after they were married. Uh, she was married to Andrew. So anyway, um, the election of 1828, um, muscling and campaign, Jackson wins. Uh, this is an anti-Jackson newspaper. It said Jackson's mother was a common prostitute brought to this country by the British soldiers. She afterwards married a mulatto man with whom she had several children, one of which was Andrew Jackson, which I, find, I thought was funny. Uh, they accused that uh, um, Jackson, they, or sorry, they accused Adams of being a pimp and that he had a gambling ring in the White House, all kind of just false crap. Um, so it was, it was kind of interesting. This is actually a tomb of, of Jackson's wife, Rachel. I've actually been to his, his house, Hermitage, um, in uh, Nashville area. The election of 1828, uh, Jackson wins. Uh, you can see he definitely wins the, the electoral vote and, uh, you know, gets almost, um, you know, 140-something thousand more popular votes than um, John Quincy Adams. So Jackson kind of personified this rise of the common man to the presidency, and, the, and a lot of commoners related to Andrew Jackson, at least in their minds, and they saw that it was finally their interests are now uh, winning the presidency, and they felt like the government's really actually representing them, uh, and so forth. So um, you can see the difference between elections. Now, Henry Clay had won some states and some electoral votes um, as running as well. And so, and the reason, one of the reasons why you see more and more of Andrew Jackson becoming popular and winning election is because you see that non-property owning men had uh, adult white men could vote. So let's we'll talk about the electoral pro process and then uh, Jackson's inauguration. Then we'll, we'll stop there for this first part. But so between 1790 and 1828, um, in order to run for president, you had a small caucus that, that chose a candidate. So, you know, uh, had a group that would choose Thomas Jefferson as a Democrat Republican to run. Um, but between 1828 to 1900, you began having party conventions. So members of political parties would um, meet and nominate a candidate. And so it was supposedly eliminated this King Caucus of just elites only running for president. So that happens with uh, the rise of Andrew Jackson. And then um, later in American history, with uh, the progressive movement in the early 1900s, they enact what's called direct primaries, um, where now we as voters, registered voters, which is important to register, to get the, the chance to vote in a direct primary so we could decide who who's going to run for your political party in the main election. Now, Jackson's inauguration was a huge party um, to a certain extent. All these people traveled from across the country um, and they camped on the White House lawn to celebrate the rise of Andrew Jackson because they really were just so pumped that they had somebody in the White House that re they thought represented them. And, and it was a uh, the critics called it a king mob and so forth. And and so Jackson was a very much a polarizing figure. He was either beloved or, or hated. There wasn't a whole lot in between. Um, so we'll stop there and we'll get to Jackson's presidency in part two.